Hi class, this is your professor Joseph. So you're in your first week right now and I wanted to break a few things down for you um, conceptually so that you get not just the uh, bark on the trees but the whole forest. You know, have you ever heard of that um, expression before? Um, so what I mean by bark on the trees, you're going to get a lot of details in your readings from uh, different philosophers and you're going to see different arguments. But I also want you to stand back and see the whole big picture of philosophy or the forest in general. And I got a couple different ways of doing that. So one, let's go to this document that I made. So <clears throat> in bold, there's going to be a few different um, aspects that I'm going to highlight here. And, you know, of course, there's a video, so you can listen to it a few times. But so let's go back. Let me see. The most broad thing I can start with first is this. Our book is called The Great Conversation. And what it's going to do is bring together a lot of different ideas and concepts in the overall picture of philosophy in general. And then we're going to have a conversation or it's going to be unpacking a conversation with you from the pre-Socratics all the way to the moderns. So whether you're in my ancient class or modern class, doesn't matter. This book covers both. It's got 30 chapters, one through 15 is ancient, and then, you know, to medieval, and 16 through 30 is um, early modern, you know, through the modern period. But either way, <clears throat> this lecture is for both classes, but I wanted to tell you is this. So, We'll start off. You're in a philosophy class. It just so happens to be called, you know, philosophy of ancient or philosophy of modern. So those are specific classes within the whole umbrella of philosophy. So like what the hey, hey is philosophy, right? It's not some vague word. So let's just break this down. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. Philosophia, two Greek words. Philo is like a brotherly, um, Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, philo <clears throat> is like a brotherly love. So we can think of, um, man, the Greeks will do this. So when we when we talk in English, like, you know, I love somebody, um, the Greeks might say, well, that's kind of vague. And they have very specific words for love that they would use. So, for example, um, I might say, I love my wife, I love my dog. I love my daughter. I love playing chess. You know, all these different aspects here. I love my family. Whereas the Greeks would say, okay, <clears throat> so if you love your family or your brother or sister, we'll call that phileo love, um, brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia in the United States, for example, that is the city of brotherly love. Interesting. It's right from the Greeks. Um, what about eros love? So Eros love is specifically a romantic love. Notice it's different than brotherly or sisterly love. Then there is family love that the Greeks would uh, call storge love. And then there is unconditional or godly love called agape love. So the Greeks have given us four words now for love. Philo, Eros, storge, and agape. They all mean love, but very different specific aspects of love. Whereas the English is just like, hey man, I love this, or I love you, or I love that, you know. So in that sense, the Greeks are mind-blowing because they have more specific language <clears throat> that maps onto reality. Um, so, yes. Sophia, wisdom, uh, fellow love, so love of wisdom, so we get philosophy, right? So what I want to do now is unpack, in your books, you're going to be having a lot come at you from different philosophers and different kinds of arguments, right? Well, again, those are the, that's the bark on the trees, these, these specific things. Now, now that we've defined philosophy, the love of wisdom, um, helpful, it's helpful to understand the main branches of philosophy. Now, this is not an ethics class or a logic class. It's specifically you know, history of ancient philosophy or history of modern philosophy. But to, if this, let's say this was the only class you took in philosophy, you might be missing some of the bigger picture. And here it is right here. So when you study philosophy, there are main branches of philosophy. One is metaphysics. Another one's epistemology. Another one, logic. Another one, ethics. Another one, even aesthetics. <clears throat> and 
let's say, you know, you take uh, Mount Sachs, Phil Five, Intro to Philosophy, you might get different branches of philosophy coming at, at you in this class. Here, I don't, you know, specifically teach these branches, but you're getting exposed to all of these in your book. So, for example, metaphysics, it's a branch of philosophy that deals with reality. What is reality? And when we ask questions like that, we'll be thinking about God. Does God exist? What is God? What is free will? Um, what is agency? What does it mean for me? And uh, what does it mean for me to be a human person? So it's kind of like the what is question. What is something? Epistemology deals with knowledge, belief, skepticism. So um, how do you how do you know that you know something? Whether just believing something. So you might say, I know this, but in actuality, you just believe it. A belief can be true or false, meaning it either maps on to reality or it doesn't. And if it maps on to reality, you're justified. Whoa, this is interesting. So a lot of different words coming at you here, right? And they all have to do with knowledge. So you might say that knowledge, like a good starting point, going back to Plato, is something called justified true belief. So in order to have an instance of knowledge in your life, you have to have three things justification has to be true and you have to believe it and you might say philosophers have debated uh, you know exactly what knowledge means from plato all the way up until now and we get things like um, gettier counter examples and all this kind of stuff but let's just say we start real simply knowledge is justified true belief justification means you have certain evidence um, for things, belief, meaning you're ready to act upon something as if it's true in reality. And then whether it's true or not, literally, um, does it map on to reality or not? If all those things are present, you might say you have an instance of knowledge. <clears throat> Skepticism. What is it? Well, um, suspending judgment about something rather than saying, I believe it, or I know it. You might say, I'm not sure. I actually don't know. I need to learn enough about it, or I need to learn more about it, or I don't know if we can actually know about it. So those are a class of questions that deal with epistemology. Logic. Logic specifically deals with arguments and argument structures. And you might even say critical thinking uh, is lumped into here. Critical thinking is more about the beliefs that you hold and the thoughts that you hold collectively, and logic is specifically about arguments, but they both work hand in hand. And in logic, you talk about validity and soundness and cogency and strength and all that. Those are all related to arguments. Ethics, um, good, bad, wrong, or right. So you might say wrong and right actions and good and bad people. Um, some of those are used interchangeably. You might say ethically and morally are used interchangeably as well. Um, one stems from Greek, one stems from Latin. So anyways, I won't get into the weeds there. Another branch, aesthetics, um, beauty, right? So some of you might be thinking, well, I'm not into beauty. That's for like uh, people that want to do fingernails and hair and all that. Oh, no, no, no. So the Greeks would say, you know, let me just break it down for you. So we all, we all seek pleasure in our life, but well, exactly like, what is it? What is beauty? Well, just to give you an example, um, Beauty might be found in music and watching movies and going to Hawaii and, you know, visiting certain places of the world. We're seeking beauty. So this maps on to everybody, everybody. We all seek beauty. We might just not think we're doing that. And, and, and for some men out there, you might say, well, I don't, I don't use that word beautiful. I, I say it's cool. Okay. Well, what do you mean by cool? See where we're going? Everything you say can be further. We can ask further questions about it. So, Beauty slash cool. Um, you get pleasure in doing it. So this is all fascinating stuff. These are different branches of philosophy that specifically drill down into these different areas. So what's the, what's the point of all this? Well, when you're in your book and you're reading about these certain arguments about reality, you might be thinking, ah, this author contributes to metaphysics a lot more than, let's say, ethics or logic. Or this author contributes to epistemology more. Or this author contributes to ethics more. Or this author contributes to freaking everything under the sun, you know. But these main branches will help you. Now, at an underground, uh, at an undergrad level like this, this is just a, this is just a basic course for me to help you get exposure into these different areas. 
But the reason I do this is I'm going the extra mile. Some of you are philosophy majors. Some of you want to go on and do a bachelor's degree in philosophy. Uh, philosophy. Some of you might want to do a graduate degree in philosophy. So you might say if you do undergrad, you're going to get different classes. Um, let's say you transfer out to UCLA or UC Irvine or whatever, you know, undergrad college. You might have a very specific class called epistemology. And at the graduate level, you most certainly will have an epistemology class and a metaphysics class and a logic and all that kind of stuff. So um, there you go. There's your branches. Now, what's the goal of philosophy and philosophical thinking? Well, for me, you know, you're going to get different answers from different professors, different people. I'm going to say, because I'm an analytic philosopher, I'm going to say the goal of philosophy is conceptual clarity. Whatever concepts we have about um, reality, we want to make sure we're clear on what we are doing when we're talking about them. For example, when somebody says, hey, you know, I believe in God. That might be an idea, God. A concept might be like, well, what do you mean by God? Like, what's the nature of God? What kind of attributes does God have? That's more, that's getting into um, conceptual clarity now. And you're going to find out that there's all kinds of disagreement. And that will, um, some of that will have to do on conceptual clarity. Like, do you know what God is? Or do you know how to be clear uh, when you're talking about the concept of God? So I would say that's a goal. You want to get more clear on the concepts that you use that come from ideas that we think about when, when um, we're thinking about reality in general and, and us ourselves, you know, as human persons. And I'll get into that in a second. But so the goal philosophy, conceptual clarity, conceptual clarity deals with ideas about reality. Well, what's an idea? A more general thought about reality you might have. It is more vague. It's a more vague category of thinking. So here's an example of an idea. Hey, let's talk about free will. The idea might be free will. Real general, right? Now we'll get into a concept and I'll, I'll give you an example of how it relates to that idea. So what's a concept? Think of a concept as an example of a specific idea mapped out in reality. In other words, a concept is an idea given a specific trajectory, meaning you start with it and we're going to talk about it and see how it looks out there in reality. Concepts are more tightly defined and focused about some thing more or less well defined. So now let me give you an example. A concept, human persons, so sorry, so this guy right here, the idea, we're talking about free will. Now, if we're going to talk about the concept of free will, it'll be more specific. Like human persons who have free will also have some aspect of moral responsibility as well, or moral responsibility. So notice, free will, very general idea, right? Concept of free will, a lot of specific things coming uh, into play now. Don't get hung up on that. I'm just giving you an example. You, some of you might use idea and concept interchangeably. That's fine. But in this class, if you want to think about it more clearly, you might you might separate an idea and a concept. Just say an idea is more general, concepts more specific. Okay. And when we're dealing with conceptual clarity, if that's one of the goals of philosophy, you might say, well, we have to start with general ideas. And then in these chapters, we're going to see that the philosophers get very specific about these ideas. They're mapping out the concepts of the ideas. So now last. Now, what are the great ideas of the Western world and how do they fit into these branches of philosophy? So you got these main branches. These philosophers are going to contribute to them somehow in these chapters. Well, they're also going to be using very specific ideas and concepts related to them when they're, you know, discussing these main branches of philosophy. So um, let me give you an example. This will get a little bit more clear for you. So let's do this, ding dong. Let me start very basic. What's an idea? Like I've already hashed this out, but let me, let me map it out again. In the vocabulary of daily speech, the word idea is generally used to name the subjective contents of our own minds, things that each of us has in his or her mind. Okay, so um, now let me go to different kinds of ideas. Oh, let me see right here. Sorry about that. Okay, now this. 
Now I have this, just let me uh, segue for a second here. Um, I have the great books of the Western world. You can look this up. In fact, I talk about this if you are bored and you want to go all the way down to your syllabus on the front page of your canvas. Favorite school. So some of the stuff I'm pulling out here, great books of the Western world for your syllabus, it's coming from these sorts of, um, well, let me give you an example. So like great books of the Western world. This great book set in it has this. It has a set of ideas. There's 102 of them. A lot of them, right? You might say, like, who cares about philosophy? Here I am in this class. Well, here's why you could care. Again, we want to get, we want to have the love of wisdom. We want to know things. We want to be able to connect the dots and see a bigger picture here using our ideas about reality. Let's just say that most of the things that you could think about in reality are, they will fit in one or more of these ideas, angel, art, being, chance, courage, you know, democracy, duty, emotion, evolution. There's so many here, right? And they're cool. Like, oh, logic. Oh, there's a main branch of philosophy. It's also an idea. Mathematics, memory, mind, all the way down to wisdom, space. So think of these as 102 great ideas that philosophers have wrestled with from the pre-Socratic area all the way up until now. Each of these philosophers are going to pick an idea or two or three or four or whatever, and they're going to drill down into it more by giving you examples of it, which would be their concepts of it, okay? You're going to find out that these philosophers will disagree with one another, but still, you get the point here. So, how many of you are fascinated by now? Raise your hand. Okay, like me too. And you, you wonder why I've been addicted to philosophy now for over 20 years and I'm doing a PhD in it and I'm almost done with that. It's because I, like you, were exposed to this a long time ago in 1996, my first philosophy class. And when I was in that class, I wish somebody would came along and, and broke down some of the basics for me. Like, hey, here's some main branches of philosophy. Here's, here's a lot of different ideas that you're going to wrestle with. And here's the bigger picture overall. That's what I'm trying to do with you now. So there's a list of ideas. And those ideas will be scattered through these main branches of philosophy, aesthetics, ethics, logic, epistemology, metaphysics. And again, some philosophers will deal with maybe one branch with a few different ideas and how they all relate to each other. Some may deal with all the branches. Aristotle, he discusses like everything. He was a brilliant philosopher. So you're going to see a lot of these come in when you read Aristotle. Whereas like Democrates, like one of your first readings, right? He's only going to be talking about a couple things. One of them is materialism, right? He, he thinks everything in, in reality is made up of material things. So he's going to be discussing more of a metaphysical um, concept. And he's going to say, look, everything's, everything's material, including you. Um, so he's going to be in this category mainly, right? Whereas, you know, different philosophers will be spread out through all these main branches. So anyways, I, I'm i trying to do this just to give you a, a bigger picture of what you can get out of this class, even though it's, you know, history of ancient all the way to medieval philosophy. Now you're thinking to yourself, oh, oh okay, I see. So if you like philosophy and you take other classes, you can explore metaphysics more or epistemology or logic for even like, for example, at Mount Sac, you could take a logic class or a critical thinking class. You can take an ethics class. We don't offer aesthetics here, but you could be thinking about that. In epistemology metaphysics, well, you could take philosophy five. Here in, in my class, you'll be exposed to all of them briefly. Okay. So anyways, I hope that helps. And last but not, ugh, last but not least, I put this as a recommended reading, but you certainly do not have to get this book. But if you want to go the extra mile, um, get the Philosopher's Toolkit. I think you can get this thing for either free online, some PDF somewhere, that's up to you to get, or you can buy it for like 10 bucks. Me, I always prefer hardback books. I'm old school like that. But the Philosopher's Toolkit is, it helps you break down philosophical jargon. 
some of you are new to philosophy. There's a lot of terms coming at you and you're like, oh my gosh, man, like what's this? What's Occam's razor? What's inductive versus deductive? What's, you know, whatever. So it's like when you go to a car salesman or a mechanic and there's, there's, they're discussing all this mechanic jargon and cylinders and pistons and all that. And you're like, uh, and let's say you're not into cars. They're, they're throwing jargon at you. Well, let's say you're new to philosophy. The more familiar with jargon that you are and terms, the more you can feel confident in how you express yourself, ask your questions, do your writing. So the book is kind of like an ally. It's an aid. Um, I didn't know about books like this when I was taking a class like you um, are now, and I wish I had books like this, but let me give you an example. So it's a toolkit, right? Let me show you. So if you were to get the book, let's say, um, you can go to, what is it, the, the, the table of contents, and here's what I mean by... Um, jargon um like argument deduction induction validity soundness invalidity consistency fallacies like oh that's a lot right if you wanted to drill down on any one of these just click it like a page or two and it kind of defines it for you it gives you all kinds of you know um examples and i will um i will pick out one right here ellen schuss aporia so this will this distinction will be helpful you helpful for you when you're in the um the chapter on socrates and the socratic method like what exactly is it ah well it's a form of ellen shoes designed to bring you to a state of aphoria well what is that aphoria look it up and if you don't get this book fine just look it up online or, or just keep these words in mind right i won't give it away right now actually i will let's just go straight to 5.3 i mean what the hey hey i'm already here so, Ellen Schuess. Without question, among the most important philosophical texts or produced are the, uh, Plato's dialogues. And as you're going to find out, Plato, like Socrates didn't write anything down. His, his homeboy Plato did. So when we're studying about philosophy, or, uh, Socrates, we're going to be looking at the Plato's dialogues. So let me just go down. Plato's texts often closed with Socrates enmeshing his interlocutor that just means somebody else dialoguing with you um, within the lines of argument so a dialectical strategy of bringing an interlocutor to an impasse is called the Socratic Ellen shoes and the philosophical impasse itself is called the Foria so when you talk about let's say like courage or we find out through there's a dialogue in Plato called Lockies um, where these this general general Lockies, he he's asking socrates hey i i want to i want you to teach my kids about virtue and socrates will like well um if i if we can define what virtue is then i'll help you and then specifically socrates says well let's start here what is courage um well let's just long story short at the end of the dialogue socrates brings the general to a state of ellen so I mean, he's just he doesn't know um, and he's in a state of euphoria. He's just, he's frustrated. He's confused. Well, that's the whole point of the Socratic method is that you want to come closer to the truth, getting clear on the concept of, let's say, virtue and courage. And sometimes you might not always have a clear answer. So the purpose of that Socratic method using Ellen Schuess and euphoria is to bring you to a state where you say, wow, I don't know. Or, if I want to know more about this, I've got to ask more questions. So again, now let me read the rest of this. The term aporia is like a, uh, is like amoral, a primitive word, which literally means being non-porous or not having a way out or through. It just means you're stuck. Like, ugh, I, I'm stuck. I don't know. In philosophical context, aporia might be described as a condition of perplexity or bafflement, literally a blockage in the flow of the argument. So, um, I go into this just because I'm giving you an example now of jargon that you might hear, philosophical jargon. If somebody ever says Ellen Schuess or Aporia or Interlocutor, you might go back to your book and be like, oh, and just look it up. And again, you'll, you'll know more about that when you get to the Socrates chapter. Um, but that's pretty much 
Let me see here. Back to my... There it is.